We're so excited to have our local legend, Tud Ryan Stein, here presenting your Big Backyard, the New Normal New England Road Trip. I will now turn it over to our esteemed guest, author, speaker, and writer, Tud Ryan Stein. Thank you very much, Margaret. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And uh, thank you all for uh, joining me tonight. Thank you to the friends of the Thomas Crane. Uh, I've been there in person. I wish we were there in person tonight. Although, you know, as Margaret and I were saying just before we began, this is one of those little hidden blessings, if there can possibly be such a thing, of this whole crazy period, right? Because if we were actually supposed to be in person tonight, this probably would have been canceled. So here we are able to be here anyway. Thank you all for joining me. So tonight... Uh, I'm going to take you on a road trip around New England in just under an hour and uh, going to be some of my favorite places, some of my favorite people, some of my favorite things to eat, a lot of that. Um, so I always like to start by, you know, asking people like, what, what do you think of when you think of New England? And before... <laughs> Before I do that, actually, I want to do one tiny little housekeeping thing for myself. I want to change the view of my thing here. Okay, there we are. And uh, that should be a little bit better. That should be a little bit better. So um, I like to ask people, what do they think of when they think of New England in the sense of like, you know, like, a, like, a, like an iconic restaurant, you know, has its signature dishes, you know. What would you think of if New England, uh, you know, was that kind of, with that kind of, of comparison, and obviously you think of the ocean in New England, you think of mountains in New England, and um, also obviously history um, certainly defines New England. And also, you know, with that metaphor of like a, a, an iconic restaurant, you know, always has like certain side dishes that they're famous for, right? So if New England had, you know, famous side dishes, what would those be? Certainly, uh, politics, uh, for sure. Um, certainly sports and certainly actual food in the sense of seafood, because after all, people do come to Boston and New England from all over the country, all over the world, really, for its legendary seafood. Now, extra credit if you know that that natty gentleman in the fedora in the black and white picture is Boston's famous rogue mayor, James Michael Curley. Uh, and Obviously, number six, Hall of Fame Celtics center, Bill Russell needs no introduction, and neither does lobster. Although, it's not going to be lobster that we're actually going to be talking about in a few minutes here tonight as part of a, a, a legendary part of the North Shore of New England, a different, different shellfish. Um, and if you're at all familiar with any of my traveling around New England for Chronicle, you probably know that um, food is, is never far from from my mind or my stories. Although one particular kind of food, um, I love to eat. It's a wonder I don't weigh 700 pounds, but uh, diners, not really big on like fancy food, French restaurant, nothing against them. Just not my cup of tea or plate of food. And, uh, but diners, I love classic old New England diners. So as a little bonus round, right when we finish our tour tonight, I'm going to set us out on a quick, like, 45-second to a minute trip to the diners that are in the states that we're going to visit. So you'll see. Um, so here's our compass headings. If you're wondering where we're headed tonight, we're going to – Boston's going to be our jumping-off point and our ending point. We're going to go north to the North Shore and further north into Maine. And then we're going to go west into the mountains, the White Mountains of, of New Hampshire. Before that, we're going to be in the mountains of western Maine. And then we're going to be further west in the Green Mountains of Vermont. Then we're going to be coming south and coming back into Massachusetts to the Berkshires. And then we'll have a few surprises. More on that. So um, with that, I hope everybody's comfortable. I hope you have a little bowl of popcorn or a snack or something in front of you and we're off. So I said, we're going to start first on the North shore. Um, so I grew up in Winthrop. So I know a little bit about the North shore. I always call Winthrop the uh, charming little seaside town at the end of runway 27 L. Uh, yeah. Noisy childhood, but you know, it's funny. It's funny speaking with folks from Quincy tonight, because I also always say in this talk that Winthrop is to the North shore what Quincy is to the South Shore, which is to say both towns, in Quincy's case, a city, but both places 
are really kind of gateways to their respective shore, right? Because Winthrop is really just the gateway to the North Shore. It's barely on the North Shore. It just kind of sticks out into Boston Harbor there. And, you know, as I said, um, Plains very much a part of Winthrop's history. It sits right at the end of runways at Logan Airport. So I had some fun with a picture here pointing out my boyhood home in the Highlands, a plane, and, um, and a field where I played baseball uh, as a kid and a teenager in Point Shirley. So Point Shirley in Winthrop is the point which is actually closest physically, physically less than 2,500 yards uh, from a runway at Logan Airport. So that's, that's pretty close. You could never build a major metropolitan airport like that so close to a densely populated area. Winthrop is the most densely populated town in Massachusetts. You could never build that today. But of course, when Logan Airport was built in the 1920s, they were only flying out of their prop mail planes that were servicing Providence, New York, and Philadelphia. So nobody was foreseeing jumbo jets at that point. So with that out of the way, the gateway, we're through the gateway, right? Now we're on to the, the real North Shore, as it were, uh, Cape Ann. So I, I love Cape Ann. Um, I, I, I always like to point out to folks that Massachusetts does, after all, have two capes, but only one of them is, you know, you don't have to identify which one you're going to. If you say on Friday afternoon, I'm headed to the Cape for the weekend, no one in history has ever asked, oh, which one? Never. It's never happened. So um, it should because Cape Ann is a wonderful place in its own right, as we're about to see. European settlement there goes back more than a century before Cape Cod. Um, doesn't have everything Cape Cod has. Doesn't have the congestion in the summer. It doesn't have a mini golf course every 1,500 feet. But um, it has wonderful history of its own. You know, it was an island until almost the 1960s with the building of the Abram P. at Andrew Jr. Bridge. Uh, which connected Route 128 and Cape Ann, then Cape Ann was no longer an island. It actually was before that. Um, only one city, actual city on Cape Ann, and that's, of course, Gloucester. Uh, here's a wonderful photograph of Gloucester Harbor by a wonderful longtime friend of mine, Mark Canagas. Mark is a terrifically talented landscape photographer, native of Rockport, uh, Cape Ann's other most famous place. And uh, here is Rockport Harbor, a photograph that Mark Canigas took of uh, famous motif number one. You know, um, motif number one is one of those landmarks in New England that people outside of New England think of when they think of New England. Like they see that, even though it's kind of, it's kind of like a set piece, right? It is. I mean, that's what it is. It's kind of a, it's kind of a set piece um, on a stage, which happens to be Rockport Harbor. You know, there was a time that it was said that motif number one in Rockport Harbor was America's most photographed and most painted landmark. I don't think that was ever true, uh, but they certainly like to say that in Rockport. Um, but the funny thing is, you know, so it, it's a very famous landmark. It's what people think of when they think of New England. And um, as you can see, motif number one was um, what someone in the art department of my publisher thought of with my first book because they put it on the cover. I thought it made it look like a cookbook, but um, authors very rarely have any say about the artwork uh, in a book. But funny thing about motif number one, it has a companion motif that most people have no idea. So years ago, I found myself wondering what that white building is right behind motif number one. So about the same time, I met a wonderful Rockport guy named Gussie Contrino. Gussie is a um, longtime lobsterman out of Rockport Harbor. And um, I was standing in Rockport Harbor one day, and I asked him, I said, Gus, so I want you to look behind motif number one, right? You see there's a white building behind motif number one, right? So I have no idea what that was. So I asked Gussie Contrino, I said, what is that white building behind motif number one. And without a beat, he said, motif number two. What? What's, doesn't that make sense? <laughs> and there you have it. Now you know what the building behind motif number one is. So how about point, if you've ever been to um, Cape Ann, you may have been there. Uh, it's an abandoned granite quarry. It is the, one of the most further, most east, eastern points on the continental U.S. In fact, Halibut Point, and Cape Porpoise, Maine, are the two points along the continental U.S. that first 
have the, the, the rising light in the east, the rising sun in the east hit them. It's also where you will find the lobster pool, which is a wonderful place uh, right near Halibut Point, just down the street to see a sunset. Uh, love it there, but it is not lobster that made Cape Ann famous. I said it was a different shellfish. Indeed, it was. It was fried clams. Uh, in fact, the fried clam was said to have been invented in Cape Ann, in Essex, at a place I'm sure many of you have been, and that would be Woodman's. Uh, so the story goes something like this. Um, about 100 years ago, Chubby Woodman, who is the guy who started it all at Woodman's, and his wife, Bessie, they owned a little shop up there. They sold seafood. They sold potatoes. They had a fryer. They chopped up these potatoes really thin, and they sort of their version of a potato chip. And they sold these at their little shop. And um, about 100 years ago, a uh, hot summer day, fisherman friend of theirs came in. He's sitting for a while with them, and he's watching them work. And he's watching Chubby shuck clams, and he's watching Bessie Woodman toss potatoes into the fryer. And he says to Chubby Woodman, he says, hey, Chubb, you ever toss one of those clams into the fryer? And Chubby said, no, never have. And uh, they decided that sounded like a fun thing to do on a boring, hot, hazy, humid summer morning. So they did. They tossed a piece of shucked clam into the fryer. And they fished it out. And it was inedible. Inedible, like rubber. But Bessie Woodman, observing this, was about to prove the truth of the famous maxim, behind every successful man, there's an even smarter woman. She took a clam, she dredged it through the batter she was using for the potatoes, tossed that into the fryer, they took that out, and the rest is history. Suddenly, people were lining up in long lines to try this new thing, the fried clam. Can you imagine when that was new? The fried clam at Woodman's, and, uh, and it made... Cape Ann famous for fried clams. And today, Route 133, which goes across Cape Ann, is known as the Clam Highway. There were three, I would say, sort of preeminent landmark fried clam joints in Cape Ann. Um, and they've sometimes been referred to as the Clam Wars. You know, obviously, Woodman's in Essex and also Farnham's in Essex, which is just down the street, and uh, over in Ipswich, the Clam Box. But there are, there's no clam war, trust me. Um, that's just a bit of promotional gimmickry. Uh, I've known the owners of all three of these places. They're all the best of friends. On any given hot, busy Saturday night, if one of them runs low on clams, one of them will send a runner over to get a bushel of fried cl of clams from another place. So no clam wars. And with that, we are on to Maine. We're on to our, our, our next state, uh, the state of Maine, where the mountains meet the sea. And, uh, you know, if you travel north out of Boston and toward Maine, even though you're going, we would say you're going up to Maine, we say you're going down east, to which anyone elsewhere in the country goes, I don't get that. But that's what we say. So I love Maine. I love seacoast Maine. I love interior Maine. Um, but I will tell you that there are two statistics, two factoids about Maine that are my favorites. And I'm going to share both of them with you right now. One of them is completely self-evident. You're looking at it. Maine is the only state in the country that borders only one other state. I think if Mainers had their way, they wouldn't border any other state. Of course, that would make Maine Hawaii. So that wouldn't really work. The other, the other factoid um, takes a little more explaining, but it's also evident, really. Think about the ragged and rocky coast of Maine, right? It threads its way. The coastline goes in and out, in and out. All those little inlets, all those little finger peninsulas, all those little islands. You know, you can take five and a half, six hours to drive some from, say, Kittery up to Bar Harbor, right? That's how long it takes because of the road goes in and out and in and out. There's, it's not a direct route. Um, but if you could straighten out that ragged and rocky coast of Maine, like a balled up piece of twine and just, you know, Bang, and straighten it out into a straight line, you know what you get? Just what it says right there. 3,000 miles. In other words, the distance between Boston and San Francisco. Um, so 
Question, does anyone know where we are? Now I miss being in person because this is when I could, you know, ask for a show of hands. But um, uh, I'll give you a hint. I'll give you a hint. It's on Muscongas Bay. Did that help? Probably not. Um, we are in Pemaquid Point. Pemaquid Point, speaking of the ragged and rocky coast of Maine, is just absolutely one of my favorite places on coastal Maine. Um, it just sort of sums up that, that phrase itself, the ragged and rocky coast of Maine. It is in mid-coast Maine. So you would go up a couple hours north of Portland. You'd get to, say, Brunswick, Topsom. You'd bang right, head south for about 21 miles. And when the road runs out, you'd be in the little town of Bristol. And that's what you'd see right at the end of the road. Um, but it's not the lighthouse that has always drawn me to Pemaquid Point. It's a nice lighthouse. It's not an unusual lighthouse. In fact, if that lighthouse looks a little bit familiar, that's because it was a very, very familiar design. It was used commonly throughout the 19th century. It was very economical to build. Dozens of lighthouses look like that. Um, oh God, right off the top of my head, Nobska, right? Falmouth on the Cape. The Nubble, also in Maine. Looks like a shortened version of Boston Light out in the harbor, right? But it's not the lighthouse that's always drawn me there. It's what's behind the lighthouse. Because there behind the lighthouse, there is like this field of about, I would say six acres of these really extraordinary striated rocks that just form this field that goes down into the water. Muscongas Bay there forms kind of a horseshoe, so you can't see to the north, you can't see to the south, just straight out to the horizon, next stop coast of Europe. It's fascinating in all weather. It's fascinating in all seasons, all times of day. I just love it. I love it. If you ever go, if you haven't been, uh, do watch out if you watch, walk down on that rock field behind the lighthouse, because uh, particularly right after the tide has gone out, uh, the rocks can be pretty slippery. But I want to let you in on a, on a little quest, a little quest that, that kind of informs this next story. Um, so for about 20 years, I was on a quest in my traveling uh, for Chronicle um, to find the best clam chowder I could possibly find. I uh, started out in New England, and then I thought, well, I, no, I, I'm going to try to find the best clam chowder in America, having sampled clam chowder coast to coast. But um, about eight to ten years ago, or less, maybe six years ago, um, I found it. Quest over. I found it. I found the best clam chowder I had ever tasted. And believe it or not, it was in Midcoast, Maine. It was in Brunswick, Maine where you would take that turn to go down toward Pemaquid Point. And that surprised me. And it surprised me for a couple of reasons. It surprised me, first of all, that it was in Midcoast, Maine. I thought it might have been further north. I thought it might have been somewhere else. Um, and it surprised me the place that actually had the fried clams because this place does not have, the, first of all, when I tell you what this place used to be, it will be doubly surprising. Um, it's called the Granette Trading Company, which doesn't in any way refer to food of any kind, right? Never mind seafood. I mean, it sounds like a place, the Granette Trading Company sounds like a place that you might get, you know, scented candles, right? And that little building, it had its first life as a tiny little two-car car repair garage. So uh, they cleaned it out pretty good, don't worry. But uh, it doesn't look like a little seafood place. Oh, maybe it does now, but it should because it was renovated and is run now by two wonderful longtime people of the sea, Julie and Brian Soper. Both used to be commercial fishermen. Brian still is. Julie decided to get in off the water about a decade ago. Uh, she, wonderful cook, had a book full of recipes and wanted to open up her own place, and she did. Brian is still a commercial scalloper, and I like to point out, if you like scallops, you'll never get fresher scallops than here. The reason being that Brian scallops pretty much every morning and he might come in off the water about nine o'clock, eight thirty. He's all done nine o'clock. And um, then he would bring a bushel of scallops or so over to Julie at the restaurant. So he might be dropping off a bushel, bushel of scallops at 1030. They're open up for lunch at 1130. And if you are to the scallop plate, you might be eating scallops that were sitting on the ocean floor 60 minutes earlier. 
That's fresh. That's fresh, right? But back to the story of the Quest, because they have the best clam chowder I've ever tasted. I was in there about six years ago. I was in there with my longtime buddy and Chronicle photographer, Carl Vieira. And uh, we were driving by. I'd never been there. We're doing a story in Brunswick. In fact, we were headed down to Pemaquay Point. And um, said, looks, looks, looks interesting. Let's stop. We ordered, I think we ordered like a tuna roll and a couple of bowls of chowder each, right? And chowder came out first. And uh, I tasted it. I'm going to tell you, I'm not saying that I heard like heavenly music and the hallelujah chorus in my ears, but I wasn't far from it. Uh, I was like, wow. I said to Carl, I said, did you taste this yet? And he tasted it. I said, what do you think of that? He was like, this is really good. I said, really good? I said, let me tell you something, pal. That's the best clam chowder I have ever tasted in my life. And we canceled the, two, the tuna rolls. We both ordered a second bowl of chowder. The last time I was in there, Julie saw me coming, and uh, she <laughs> remembered that. And she, um, and she sent me off with a quart of, uh, of clam chowder. What's the secret? You know, it's, I always say, it's less about what's in it than what isn't in it. First of all, uh, my metrics for great clam chowder. Don't gum up the works with potato, okay? You want to put a couple of pieces in? Fine. You like potatoes? Have potato soup. They make it, okay? Um, don't gum it up with vegetation. You get celery or whatever. Uh-uh, okay? Get a salad if you want vegetation. Don't make it too thick. It's got to be thick enough. This thing was absolute perfection. Just looking at it sort of transports me. So we're done in Maine, and now we are on to New Hampshire. And you know, if you exit Maine through the, the Western mountains of Maine, you will be in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. And I figure we might as well start at the top. The roof of New England, Mount Washington, just under 6,300 feet, the highest mountain east of the Mississippi River. Uh, I don't know why I'm not wearing a hat, in that photograph, it was about 12 below zero. Thankfully, no wind. Um, but anyway, who can explain stupidity? Um, Mount Washington, legendary mountain. Some of the worst weather in the world has happened on Mount Washington. The highest wind ever recorded happened on Mount Washington. Now, you might be familiar, like a lot of people are, uh, with the Mount Washington Auto Road. I have hiked Mount Washington. I've skied Mount Washington. I've driven up the Auto Road which leads me to my next story because this was, I was going to say kind of a funny thing that happened on the auto road. Uh, nobody got hurt. <laughs> somebody was in distress. Uh, somebody close to me. Uh, let me explain. So about seven, eight years ago, uh, my longtime Chronicle photographer, Carl Vieira, right here. There he is. There's Carl. We were shooting in the area at the base of Mount Washington and Pinkham Notch. And it was an unusually clear, sunny day for mid-October. So much so that I said, we should just hustle up the auto road and get some pictures at the top because how often do you get this kind of clear weather visibility? He said, yeah, that's a good idea. So we did. And there we are at the summit. And Carl is smiling there. He was not smiling about 30 minutes before that picture was taken. So we start heading up the auto road and we're up about 20 minutes up, about the 2000 foot level. And because I know Carl, I could tell that he was, he was, he was in discomfort. You know, he was all fidgety and he, he, was, he, was, he was just, I knew something was wrong. I said, are you okay? And he said, I, I think so, you know, but, it turns out he had a phobia that he had never shared with me. And it had to do with being in this car on the auto road. And it surprised me because Carl and I had been in every kind of conveyance uh, imaginable. Everything you can imagine in the air, 
short of the space shuttle, uh, everything on the water, pretty much everything on land, except his phobia, never came up because I don't think we'd ever driven up the auto road. And his phobia was he had a very hard time with being on a road on a, with very steep drop-offs, like off a cliff, where there was no guardrail. And that pretty much defines the auto road. So he couldn't keep going uh, without some measures. So I took over the driving. Carl took that red jacket he's wearing and put it over his head so he couldn't see. And, uh, and then he was all smiles 30 minutes later. <laughs> he's a good sport. He knows that I shared this story. He knows that I should. He just doesn't know that I share it several times a week to dozens and dozens of, of strangers. <laughs> Oh, Carl. Um, so another mountain, big mountain. Um, and this one, this mountain in New Hampshire, until, you know, relatively recently, was the home of New Hampshire's most famous landmark, Bar None. In fact, that lake, Profile Lake, got its name just for the fact that it reflected that most famous landmark. And of course, by now you know I'm talking about Franconia Notch and the famous stone face that looked out over Franconia Notch for millennia until it, until it didn't anymore, the Old Man of the Mountain. The Old Man of the Mountain is easily New Hampshire's most famous landmark. It is still on the state's highway signs. It is still on the state's uh, license plates, and driver's licenses. Um, the Old Man of the Mountain has been depicted, well, from the, from the very start of photography, on postcards, and daguerreotypes. Uh, and you know, in, in, in some ways, what's surprising about the Old Man, though, is how it was that you saw the Old Man. Because it wasn't the kind of thing, the Old Man, that you just, like, looked over and saw a mountain, right? Or looked over and saw a tree. You had to be in just the right spot and you had to be at just the right moment and you had to look and line yourself up to see because what we didn't see from the ground, right? When we drove by and looked up and saw it, those of you who had a chance to or were lucky enough to, is that the old man was not sort of this contiguous one-dimensional stone face like it was carved, right? Like it was, like it was carved out. It wasn't, right? If you made a sculpture, then you could turn it in any direction and it would still look like that face. That's not what the old man was. The old man of the mountain only looked like that from that angle that you're seeing it right there, which is to say down below the mountain at just the right angle, that's the only way it looked like that. If you looked at that exact same rock outcropping above it, below it, head onto it, closer to it, it didn't look like that at all. It didn't look like that at all. It's something of an optical illusion because the old man of the mountain was not one stone outcropping. It was actually made up of seven different tiny, tiny. I'm about to show you something in miniature. They weren't tiny, but it was made up of seven different rock outcroppings, which taken together, viewed at the right angle, looked like that stone face. You know what else you didn't see from the ground looking up at the old man of the mountain? You didn't see all the efforts that had been made over the last 75 years or so to preserve the old man, to shore up the old man, to try to keep the old man up on Cannon Mountain Cliffs because those who were involved in that knew that sooner or later, the old man was gonna come down. There was no, there was no doubt about it. It was never gonna be there forever. The fact that we had something called the, old, the, the Great Stone Face was a factor of the fact that other rocks had fallen away over thousands and thousands of years to create that stone face. And the rest of it was always going to come down. But they had tried. They had put up, as you can see, over 75 years. They had put giant cables up there with huge turnbuckles. And they had plastered concrete and all the cracks trying to shore up the old man. And it worked. It worked for a long time until, until the night of May 3rd, 2003, when it came down. 
kind of a perfect storm in some ways, literally. It had been an unusually mild spring in New Hampshire. Temperatures had reached almost 70 degrees in late April, unheard of in late April in the White Mountains, but it did. Torrential rains. And then on the night of May 3rd, a Canadian front came through. Temperature dropped over 40 degrees in 24 hours below freezing. So all that water in the cracks of those stone outcroppings froze, ice, ice expands. And about 1.30 in the morning, the rocks came down. And people were devastated. People were devastated. Uh, a lot of people in New Hampshire felt that, like they greeted it with shock, mourning, like they had lost a, a, a family member. Um, you know, I always uh, think of uh, a guy I used to joke was the other old man of the mountain, Dick Hamilton, my wonderful late friend, Dick Hamilton, who was head of tourism in, White, in the White Mountains for many years. Uh, Dick's office was in uh, Lincoln, New Hampshire, so just south of the Notch. He lived in Littleton, just north of the Notch. So he used to drive through Franconia Notch twice a day. And he said, every night he told me I, when I drove home, he said, I used to roll my window down and I used to look up into the dark and I used to say, Good night, boss. And uh, Dick, when the old man fell, was terribly sad, but he was appointed to head up a commission to look at how the old man of the mountain could be commemorated, right? Because the state wanted to find some way to commemorate the, the old man of the mountain. And um, there were all kinds of suggestions and proposals. They had put out a request for proposals, some of which were just absolutely crazy, like... There was actually a proposal to recreate the old man of the mountain in cement up on the same spot. Can you imagine? Glad that never happened. But Dick Hamilton, in all of his wisdom, was in position to approve the winning proposal. And it is winning in every way. It was ingenious. It was extraordinary. It still is because now it's a part of the mountain. Ron Magers was the person who proposed it, designed it, built it. Ron is a wonderful toy designer out of Newburyport. And his proposal was what he called a profiler. And what the profiler is, well, what does it resemble? As you can see from the picture, his profilers really, really resemble kind of an inverted hockey stick, right? But here's the thing. On the blade of the hockey stick, what Ron Magers did was he recreated all seven of those separate stone outcroppings in miniature to create the old man of the mountain's face, right? So here's an example of what I'm talking about. So this is a little miniature of the profile. I'm going to hold this up to my camera and you're going to see what I'm talking about. You see that? So on the blade of the profiler, there are seven different rock outcroppings. You see that? And all of those make up the old man of the mountain just like they did in real life. So when you view it from the right angle, it forms the great stone face. Is that cool or what? So what's remarkable about what Ron Magers did was he recreated not only what the old man looked like, he also recreated the experience that you had of seeing the old man, which is to say, it wasn't just looking up, it was getting yourself in just the right angle, getting all those different rock faces, even while you stood on the ground, that's what you were doing when you, when you got yourself in the right position, as you can see those people are doing. And today when people stand up there and I've seen people do this and they look up at the profilers and they'll say like, oh my God, it's like he's up there again. That's what it looks like. Fantastic. Such an ingenious proposal, Ron Magers. So before we leave New Hampshire, I do want to share a couple of other famous, I shouldn't say famous, I meant favorite friends of mine in New Hampshire. Um, they both live in the same town, little town in Northwoods. And Northwoods, New Hampshire is along a very famous stretch of highway in New Hampshire, uh, Route 4 between Dover, right near UNH, Southern, and then a little bit more central, uh, Chichester, Epsom, you know, the traffic circle there. And that Route 4 has a more famous name, uh, Antique Alley. 
maybe some of you have been there. Um, my favorite, I'm not, I'm not a big antique person. I mean, I like them. I like looking at them, and it, but, you know, but I, I'm, I don't collect them or anything. But I do have a favorite antique place there, and it's called the Betty House. And the Betty House is in Norwood. And um, what I like about it is that its owner, very funny guy, Charlie Yetton. Charlie Yetton is a retired high school principal and a longtime state senator. So he likes politics. He does have an interest in antique chairs. So Charlie has created this little niche market, right? Like if you're interested in finding like an antique radio or an antique uh, desk set, um, Betty House is not your place. However, if you're interested in say an antique unfinished shaker saddleback chair, ladderback chair, and say, oh, I don't know, a, an old presidential campaign poster from circa 2000, Howard Dean for president, boom, the Betty House is your place. Now, Charlie's neighbor is one of the funniest New Englanders I've ever met, Becky Rule. Becky is a prolific author. Uh, she's written more than a dozen books about New England, and uh, there are some of her books. Um, when I met Becky about six years ago, she had just come up with a book called Heading for the Rhubarb, Heading for the Rhubarb. And I realized that because Becky had written a whole book that kind of defined certain terms in New England, she would be the perfect person for me to ask a question which had long vexed me. Okay? The question is, when do you become a native in New England? Now, sure, you can say, well, if you're born in New England, you're a native. If you weren't, you're not. Not so fast. Not so fast. I have met New Englanders who are more New Englander than you and me. By that, I mean, I met, well, okay, Here, here's an example. I met uh, about 10, 12 years ago. I was at Moody's Diner in Waldeboro, Maine. And I wanted to talk to somebody and ask somebody about what it was like at this place 20, 30, 40 years ago. And I thought it was pretty safe getting that opinion from a guy who was sitting at the counter near me because this guy looked like if you, if you, if you looked in a dictionary for um, old Mainer, his picture would be there, right? And as soon as I started talking to him, I was like, wow, this guy's going to know everything about Waldeboro, Maine, and Moody's Diner. And he did. He was 97 years old, came into Moody's Diner every morning for breakfast, sounded like, like the sound of an old mainer. Yes, sir. You know, like that. Um, I said, so, so you've been coming to Moody's a long time. He was like, yes, sir. I said, right. I said, uh, so tell me, I, I assume you're a native here? No, sir. So it turns out, He'd moved to Maine when he was four months old from Patterson, New Jersey, and will not call himself a native. So I said to Becky Rule, I said, come on, Becky. There's got to be some exception for when you become a native if you've lived here since almost the day you were born. Um, and she said, oh, yeah, 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 I can tell you when you, when you can become a native if you weren't born here. I said, when? That's my question. She said, oh, that's easy. She said, when the last person in town who knows when you move there dies, you're a native. Can't argue with that logic, can you? So we're now into Vermont, the Green Mountains from the White Mountains, on Rut 100, which is really, I think, the prettiest scenic byway in the whole state of Vermont. North, south hits all the wonderful ski areas like Stowe in Mount Mansfield, which like Mount Washington is the highest point in the state of Vermont. You're looking at Stowe, the ski area on Mount Mansfield. You may not realize you're also looking at another great stone face. Did you know that Mount Mansfield also has an old man, a great stone face? No? But winter isn't the best time to, to see it. How about now? Now, mind you, this old man is said to be lying down, looking up at the sky. It's got a forehead, it's got a nose, it's got an upper lip, lower lip, chin, Adam's apple, 
Do you see it? How about now if I flip it up like that? I, it, I will admit, it is a long face. Like, please, like that mouth is down where his belly should be. But anyway, they swear by it, you know, in, in Stowe. Uh, I always say the old man of the mountain on Mount Mansfield pretty much succeeds just in making you miss the old man of the mountain in Franconia Notch that much more, right? Um, but speaking of skiing, we were talking about Stowe. Um, you know, the last year, 2020, needless to say, is a year that we'd all pretty much like to forget about. Uh, however, this is an example, a rare example of something nice that happened in 2020. Now, granted, this was, this was about two months before the pandemic took hold, uh, back in mid-January 2020. But I want to share with you, so I love to ski. I don't ski all that much anymore, but I've been skiing since I was about six, and I love to ski. Um, I love to ski, but I don't love the industry of skiing. I don't like, in some ways, well, I did one way. I don't like how expensive skiing has become. Uh, I don't like the fact that uh, skiing is prohibitively expensive. Uh, it is anyway, and it is too much so for uh, many, many people. I don't like that. I don't like, I've always thought it was exceptionally stupid of the, the business, the industry of skiing to, to make, make it so that their sport prices out, you know, entire, you know, millions and millions of people who might otherwise like it. Um, so I'm not real big on big resort skiing at all. Uh, but I do like old school, old timey, old New England ski areas. And you are looking at about the old schooliest, old timiest ski area I've ever been to. But there's more to it. It's much more than just about skiing. So you're looking at Northeast Slopes in East Corinth, Vermont, and you talk about how expensive skiing is. Not only is this place, I, I almost hate to give it away because it's like giving away somebody's famous fish, favorite fishing hole, you know, but um, nobody makes a dime at Northeast Slopes. You know, at a place like Stowe, at a place like Whistler in British Columbia, at a place like Vail or Aspen in Colorado, tens of millions of dollars are changed hands throughout the course of a season, right? No one makes one thin dime at Northeast Slopes. Why? Because it's all volunteer run. It is community run and owned. It's an entirely volunteer nonprofit. I mean, it's unheard of. It's wonderful. It's been along there around time since the 1930s. In fact, it's still running. It's still running its original rope tow, which is now the oldest continuously operating ski lift in North America. And what I love about it in terms of skiing being so expensive. So East Corinth, Vermont, which is kind of East Central Vermont, just about halfway up, a lot of low income families in that area four or five towns that make up that area. A um, lot of poverty, a lot of poverty. Um, and these are families and their kids who would otherwise simply not be skiing because it would be too expensive. Kids ski for free, flat out free all the time at Northeast Slopes. They do their gym class, for instance, once a week from skiing. All the equipment is donated. And I had such a wonderful time so how much did I spend skiing for a day at Northeast Slopes? 16 bucks. And it broke down this way. 10 bucks for a lift ticket. 10 bucks, which is about, which is actually less than a tenth, less than a tenth of what it would cost at Stowe. 10 bucks. And um, I spent another six bucks on a delicious, their signature Nor'easter burger for lunch, and I got to sit and hang out with Wade Peterson, whose turn it is to kind of be running things right now at Northeast Slopes. And uh, boy, what a, if, the, if I have one nice memory of 2020, you're looking at it. So we're done in the North Country. We're heading south. We're going to reenter Massachusetts through the Berkshires. I always think when it comes to the Berkshires, people often think of maybe two things. One, 
Stockbridge, maybe Lennox, home of the Boston Pops in the summer. Stockbridge. You think of Stockbridge, I think you almost automatically think of Norman Rockwell, who lived there the last 20 years of his life. In that black and white photograph, Rockwell is at work in his studio. That studio in the color picture in red is today on the grounds of the Norman Rockwell Museum. Maybe some of you have been. If you know anything about Rockwell, obviously you know he is not just America's, one of, one of the world's most preeminent illustrators, wonderful painter. Um, you may know that he worked almost entirely from real life models in all of his paintings. You may not know that the last 20 years of his life when he was living in Stockbridge, Rockwell really dealt to some extent with America's social issues, you know? Um, it's not very well known. Um, the social issue that really interested him the most was race in America. And uh, in 1964, he, he created a, a new work uh, that's really one of his most famous paintings now. It's called The Problem We All Live With. If you look at it on the easel, there he's working on it. Uh, and it depicts a very, very courageous little eight-year-old girl, Ruby Bridges, from New Orleans, Louisiana, who is following behind two U.S. Marshals, and she is about to single-handedly integrate a segregated public school in New Orleans, Indiana. Three years later, in 1967, Rockwell was commissioned by Life magazine to create the cover of a, of a special edition on race in America that Life was doing, and, um, and that's the cover he created. Uh, dealt with the, the integration of America's suburban neighborhoods, families of color moving in. This is Rockville, Illinois. I want to draw your attention to the young African-American gentleman in the far left, maybe far right, the way you're looking at it. I always get confused. But young African-American kid, he's got the, the long sleeve white T-shirt, a sweatshirt on, right? He's got a baseball glove behind his back. His name is Ray Gunn. First of all, how great a name is Ray Gunn, W-R-A-Y-G-U-N-N. I would have paid my parents a small stipend every month if they would change my name to Ray Gunn. Um, but Ray Gunn got the name, got into a Rockwell painting, so he was clearly doing better than I was uh, at 13. <laughs> um, how did he end up in the painting? Well, there weren't a lot of families of color living in Stockbridge in 1967, as you come as no surprise. There aren't a hell of a lot more today, but there were even fewer in 1967. But Ray Gunn's grandfather was friends with Norman Rockwell. They were social friends. They hung out together. So it must have come to pass that at some point in 1967, Norman Rockwell shared with Ray's uh, grandfather that he was working on this painting. He needed a model, a young African-American kid to pose for him. And Ray Gunn's grandfather must have said, my grandson would, is 13. He'd be perfect. Then he'll do it. And he did. So he was 13 years old when he posed for Norman Rockwell. He was uh, no longer 13. When I met Ray Gunn in 2006, he was giving tours at the Norman Rockwell Museum. And, you know, I asked him um, what it felt like, because it struck me as this incredible thing, right? So here's a guy who comes to work every day, right? And in coming to work every day, he walks by a painting done by a world-famous artist, and he's in the painting, right? Don't be like coming to painting every day, you know, and, and there's someone in the Mona Lisa in the background, and he's like, yeah, that's me. Yeah, she was okay. I, I knew her. Um, that's Ray Gunn. He's in that painting. So I said, what is it like? What is it like to come to work every day and see yourself in a painting? And he looked at the painting just like that. And then he turned back to me just like that. And he said, I don't know. I guess it's nice that there's some place in the world where every day you're 13. And he walked away. Love Ray Gunn. Driest sense of humor like the Sahara, but funny. And um, Ray Gunn is the subject of an entire chapter in my first book, New England Notebook, about the Berkshires and uh, appropriately titled Forever 13. Ray Gunn. So we're done with most of our trip and we're heading back to Boston. Now, if you've been doing the math at home, you may have been wondering, huh? So if we're done that the last time I checked, New England had six states and you just covered FOA. So 
I wouldn't want anybody to ever think I was slighting two of my favorite states in New England, Connecticut, Rhode Island. Now, I'm not, but the thing is, I'll let you in. Well, it's not a phobia. This is more like an idiosyncrasy of mine. When I travel, I like to make a loop. I like to make a clean loop. Ask my dog. Even when I'm walking, I like to make a clean little loop. So it wasn't going to really work to head out from Boston north and dive back south and go back north. So I am not slighting. I am not slighting those two states. So quickly, let me tell you a couple of my favorite things about Rhode Island. Rhode Island, spunky. That's what I think of when I think of Rhode Island. Small, uh uh-uh, spunky. You know, Texas, look, I almost hesitate to have any fun with Texas right now because they're not having much fun in Texas right now. But they will tell you in Texas because most people know because they love to point out that Rhode Island would fit into Texas 221 times. True. However, as big as Texas is, which is to say 221 times bigger than Rhode Island, there's things you won't find in Texas that you will in Rhode Island. You don't believe me? You can get perfectly decent barbecue in Rhode Island. You know what you won't find in Texas? Rhode Island-style calamari sauce. You know what else you won't find in Texas? A Rhode Island-style coffee cabinet, which if you know Rhode Island speak, you know that's a coffee milkshake made with coffee syrup. And there is no better place to get a coffee cabinet in Rhode Island than the wonderful old-time soda fountain at Delecta's Pharmacy, which is in Warren. Rhode Island. And Warren, Rhode Island has its own claim to fame because Warren, Rhode Island is like the little Russian nesting doll of states, right? You know, those little Russian nesting dolls, you you keep taking one off and they get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Warren, Rhode Island is the smallest town in the smallest county in the smallest state in America. It is true. So spunky. Yeah. I always say, you know, Texas loves to say, don't mess with Texas. Well, I would tell anybody from Texas visiting Rhode Island, I wouldn't mess around much with the average Rhode Islander either. Just a tip. So Connecticut. A lot of people think of many things when they think of Connecticut, but I just think of one, pizza. Believe believe it or not, maybe you didn't see that coming. So I've eaten pizza all over New England, all over America. I've eaten pizza all over Italy. But guess what? I've never had better. I've had good pizza elsewhere. I've never had better pizza than in New Haven, Connecticut. If you've been, you may know what I'm talking about because at both ends of Worcester Street, you will find the best pizza, I think, in America. Both of bookend, literally bookending Worcester Street in New Haven, you'll find Peppy's at one side, Sally's at the other end. There's a relationship in blood, right? So Frank Peppy opened up his place on Worcester Street in the late 1920s. He hired his nephew, Sally Consiglio. When Sally learned everything there was to know about making pizza, he opened up his own place at the other end of Worcester Street. And today they're both going strong. There's Bobby Consiglio still working the brick oven. I love it. I love it. So just as we finish, I'm going to be true to my word. Because if you were following along, you remembered I said, I was going to share with you my favorite diners from all four states that we actually visited, right? I'm going to do that right now in 35 seconds. So first of all, on the North Shore, I happen to love pies. I happen to love banana cream pie. I happen to know there's no better place in New England to get the banana cream pie than the Aguam Diner on Route 1A in Rowley. In Maine, two diners. One, I already mentioned, Moody's in Waldeboro, best diner in Maine. Although the Palace Diner in Bitterford comes in a strong second because the Palace Diner is actually my favorite kind of diner. What kind of diner is that? It's a diner that has been brought back from the dead by someone who loves a diner and wants to make a diner reborn. And that's what these two wonderful guys from Portland did in Bitterford. In New Hampshire, the Red Arrow combines two of my favorite things, great diner food and politics. And there you see former President Barack Obama when he was running for president. In in Vermont, also two diners. One, the Chelsea, they're both in Southern Vermont, the Chelsea Royal and the Hills of West Brattleboro, Vermont. How great is the Chelsea Royal Diner sign? Is that the best sign? And in Chester, Vermont, another of my favorite kind of diners, wonderful couple, always dreamed of opening up their own diner, and they did. God bless them. And as we finish, my favorite diner. Boom. There it is. You may recognize that sign if you're a diner aficionado. 
as the Boulevard Diner, how many claims to fame does the Boulevard have? How many doesn't it have? The Boulevard Diner, well, you know, it's a claim to fame above all for a diner to sport a little medallion that signifies it's a genuine Worcester car, a genuine made in Worcester where the birthplace of the diner was. The Boulevard is not only obviously a genuine Worcester dining car, it's the closest diner in the world to where a diner was built because the Worcester dining car was built less than a sixty of a mile from where it still sits in, on Shrewsbury Street. And that diner sign, boy, that says it all to me. It's warm. It's inviting. It says we're home. Come in. Take a load off. And I certainly hope as we finish up and we look at the lights of Fenway Park that that signifies the same kind of thing, right? That in a year from now, the lights will be back on at Fenway. We'll be back there in person. We'll be home. We'll be safe at home. We'll be safe everywhere. We'll be safe at, at libraries for in-person talks. And I hope when my, next, when my new book comes out next fall, I will be able to be joining you in person at the Thomas Crane. And with that, thank you. <laughs>